I'm going to hit record here. All right. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Christopher Kennedy. For those of you who don't know me, I'm one of the DMP clinical faculty, and I head up the um, IHI Open School chapter here at Frontier. We're one of the few uh, virtual chapters, so we have a little bit of a unique thing going, but Frontier does everything virtual uh, well, so um, this is another thing that we do. And so quarterly, we have presentations and uh, bring in a special speaker. And this evening, that's going to be Dr. Jacob Mears. And so let me introduce uh, Jake, and then he's going to get started. So Jacob, or Jake Mears, um, believes that healthy, empowered women are the backbone of a healthy society. To that end, he is passionate about patient autonomy, evidence-based care, and building trusted partnerships with his patients. Working out of a busy hospital-based practice in Tacoma, Washington, Jake manages pregnancy, birth, postpartum, and newborn care. He also provides gynecology and women's primary care, including performing colposcopy, endometrial biopsies, and other office-based procedures. He's experienced with managing perinatal mood disorders and substance abuse in pregnancy, and is an experienced DEA wavered MAT provider. Jake is a member of the American College of Nurse Midwives, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and the American Psychiatric Nurses Association. Jake served 25 years in the US Navy, is the father of seven children, yes, I said seven, and enjoys golfing and cycling. Jake currently works at Franciscan Health at St. Joseph's Medical Center in Tacoma, Washington. And um, you know how Frontier, we always talk about what a family it is, and you have to be careful because I met uh, Jake back at Clinical Bound a few years ago. Yep. And so you never know when you're going to be um, asked to come back and do something like this. So uh, it's been a, a pleasure to know him, and I'm excited to, to see what we have tonight. So I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Um, so I appreciate the opportunity to be here. You know, when Chris called me uh, or emailed me and said, hey, we want you to give this presentation, I had absolutely no idea um, what what we were looking for, what anybody wanted to uh, hear from me about. So, um, you know, a little bit about me, um, other than what you just read, I um, actually started out as a psychiatric NP first. Um, I did my DNP at the University of Washington and knew even when I was starting that DNP program that I wanted to be a midwife. Um, it was more of a military thing where they have a little more say as to what you're going to do um, than you do even. And so while I was still still working on my DNP at yeah. UW, I was applying to Frontier. Um, can everybody hear me okay, by the way? Good. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Um, I but I will ask everyone, please mute if you are not muted. Thanks. Awesome. Okay. So I uh, I graduated um, with my DNP as a psych NP, and literally the next day applied to Frontier. Um, and so I, I rolled right from one program into the next. And you know, it I initially when people said, well, you know, those are two very different things. You know, psychiatry and women's health. Um, the truth is they're really not. Um, one really, really lends itself to success in the other and vice versa. And I found a lot of value in being able to do both. Um, in fact, just today I had uh, one of my fellow midwives call up and say, you know, I've got this patient who has all sort of a psychiatric disorders. She's just showing up for care at 35 weeks. And by the way, she's on Subutex and we can't find anybody to prescribe for her. And Gosh, I mean, there, there couldn't be a patient more more perfect for me. I said, absolutely, throw on my schedule. Let's let's do this, and it's really been helpful to be able to to do both the psychiatry and midwifery together. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, my first midwife job, and it's a little strange when I'm I'm going to talk and, and get really excited about a job that I'm no longer at. Um, but this was a project that I was asked to help start. It was in Reno, Nevada. I retired actually out there from the military. My last duty station was in the the bustling town of Fallon, Nevada, population 7,000. And we moved to Reno to take this job because this was such a, a fun opportunity um, to start up this program here in downtown Reno. And so I titled my presentation, One Stop Shopping, really looking at how we could enhance the quality of care by combining psychiatry and women's health into one service. Um, and so what we're looking at in Reno is the problem that they were having. And I was part of this 
group that was asked to come down to Reno, Nevada, to downtown and fix, or at least help fix this problem. Um, in Reno, there's a huge population of homeless people um, and a lot of homeless, mentally ill women, combined with the fact that sex work is a bustling industry in Nevada. Um, those of you that aren't familiar with this idea, because it sounds very foreign when you talk to people that aren't familiar with Nevada and you talk about you know, serving the prostitutes and the sex worker community and people say, what, what, what in the world is that? Nevada is the only state in the union where prostitution is still a thriving, bustling industry. And even though it's technically illegal within the limits of Washoe County, um, it's everywhere. It's absolutely everywhere in Reno. And so you have a huge population of women that are struggling with mental illness, with substance abuse, and homelessness. And a lot of these women that I would I would meet were, you know, in their 40s and 50s and have never had a pap smear. Um, you know, women in their 60s and they've never even heard of a mammogram, let alone have one. And so we were asked to kind of come in and see what we could do to improve the population health there. Um, Washoe County and Nevada in general really is an area of the country where there's a gigantic mental health um, shortage. Um, less than one mental health provider per 30,000 people. And when you get out outside of Washoe County and really you know, into the rural areas. And there is an incredible amount of nothing in Nevada if you haven't driven through Nevada before. Um, you can drive for hundreds of miles in any direction sometimes and find no mental health support whatsoever. While I was on active duty, um, I was working at the Naval Medical Clinic before I ended up taking over as a commanding officer of that clinic. That was terrible. Um, and I was the only mental health provider in that county and for about three counties in any direction. And so while I was on active duty, I was also covering the local hospital and, you know, a couple other hospitals in the area because there's literally nobody else out there. Um, and in Washoe County, which is Reno and that surrounding area, Washoe County has a very low overall population income, which is funny because the cost of housing keeps going up. That's a, another story. And among those who have an annual income of less than 15,000, far less than half had any sort of health coverage. And many of them didn't even realize that they were eligible for Medicaid. This is after, you know, after the Affordable Care Act, you would still talk to people who had never had health coverage and were not aware that they could have health coverage. And so part of our mission there was to see how many people we could get signed up and then to see how many people we could actually get to take advantage of the health care benefits that they were entitled to. So this was our proposed solution. Um, myself and a couple other providers were contacted by um, this private company to come in and start a Medicaid clinic downtown. Um, and one of the challenges that we had, we said, okay, we first of all, we need to get people enrolled into Medicaid um, because, again, many of them had no idea that they were even eligible for Medicaid. And then we had to overcome some serious, um, some serious obstacles, one of which was that you have people that can't get there. How do we get them there? Um, you have people that are homeless. How do you, you know, how do you sign people up for Medicaid and how do you arrange, you know, billing and, and registration when these people don't have an address? They live literally on Mill Street downtown. Um, so all of these things, we were, we were kind of challenged to put our heads together and let's see if we could come up with a solution for some of this stuff. And so this is kind of what we, what we came up with, and I'll, and I'll get to the housing and the transportation piece later. But the first thing that we came up with was, okay, these people, these, these clients of ours who've never really had any sort of health care, uh, many of them aren't going to be able to come back for multiple visit types. And so we said, okay, one of the first things that we need to prioritize is being able to accomplish as much in one stop as we possibly can. And so I was one of the providers that they contacted primarily because when you do a, a you know database search at the time in Nevada under healthcare providers, sure enough, my name came up under psychiatric providers and women's health providers. And I had a, a couple other colleagues who were also 
dual certified in other things. Um, one of my the ones I work closest with, she was a family nurse practitioner and a psychiatric NP. And so we were all contacted primarily because they wanted to see how much we could accomplish getting people in the door. Could we, you know, in my case, could we possibly do women's health, you know, screenings and if necessary, do things like, you know, colposcopy and primary care and, oh, by the way, this person is bipolar and never been on meds. Can we do a full psychiatric assessment and start medications all in one stop? And it was it was amazing. It, it actually really worked well. Um, and one of the, the common obstacles that we would find is you would have these people who, you know, they're homeless, they're mentally ill, and they've never had preventive services whatsoever. And there's a serious trust issue. Um, you know, nobody nobody wakes up one day. I don't care what the what the media says. I don't care what you see on television. Nobody wakes up one day from a perfectly happy, healthy Norman Rockwell type life, and just says, "I think I'm going to go try heroin and and try my hand at prostitution." It, it doesn't work that way. All of these people came from a background of trauma of some kind, and so there was a serious trust issue to overcome with a lot of our clients too, which for us, that meant that initially we were going to start with some long visits and we were going to work some very long days. Um, so initially getting this clinic off the ground, we would open the clinic at seven and we would stay till 9 PM and see 20 patients in that time just because we had to make these visits longer just to have time to talk to people. You can't, you can't accomplish all of this in a 15 minute office visit. So we contracted with Amerigroup, who at the time was the primary Medicaid vendor in northern Nevada. Um, this is 2017, so I have no idea um, if they still are or not because I live in Washington now. But at the time, they were the primary Medicaid vendor. And we deliberately picked the location we did. We wanted to be right downtown. Um, if anybody's familiar with downtown Reno, that, that Mill Street area, it's not, it's not the nicest part of town. Um, there are hotels across the street that um, were well known to be places of, of, you know, human trafficking and places of prostitution. Definitely not places that you would tell your mom to stay when she was visiting town. And we also wanted to be next to the largest park downtown where we knew a lot of our clients were going to be living. Um, and it was really you know, really eye-opening to me. I'm, I, you know, I was in the Navy for 25 years, and you get used to, you know, every all of your patients. Of course, they're insured and they all have homes because they're all in the military. And you know, before that, I grew up in a very, you know, middle-class, boring, extremely Caucasian area in Bend, Oregon. So this was kind of a new thing for me, and I got to know a lot of these people. It was amazing when you can get to the point where you're walking through a park in downtown Reno and you're seeing all of these homeless people that live in the park, but all of a sudden they're not homeless people, they're your patients and you know them. And we would walk through the park at lunch and just check up on people and, and say hi to them. And, and oh my gosh, you start looking at these people as people and not, you know, not a problem to be addressed by city council or not just quote unquote homeless people. You know, that's, that's, that's Mary and that's Joseph and that's, that's Richard over there. And you know, these people and it really, it really was a perfect place for us to set up shop. Um, so some things that we had to do to get people enrolled. Number one, we had to advertise. Um, and you're not going to, you know, run television ads because these people don't have television. You're not going to, you know, do internet banners because, again, you're talking about people without phones, without access to the internet. So we started putting our signs on the benches that people would sit on to wait for the bus. Um, we started putting um, flyers up around the community on the doors of the local hotels. Um, we talked with a couple of the hotel owners and we said, look, we want to get your clients and we know they're there and we're not calling the police. We're not judging. We're just saying we know what's going on in your hotel and we want to make sure that your your people that are, are renting out your rooms are getting cancer screening and getting preventative services and getting on the psychiatric meds they need. And surprisingly, the, the hotel owners were totally for it and they let us put signs up everywhere. It, it was great. Um, 
we also made a commitment to getting people in same day or next day and we all you know all of the providers that work there we all said look if we're gonna if we're gonna make this work we have to be willing to work through lunch we have to be willing to work late we have to be willing to come in early and so we made a commitment we were going to get people in same day or next day come hell or high water and we did and it was great um we ended up as as things took off and started to become at least somewhat financially stable we were able to add a transportation service and so we had somebody coming around with a bus and picking people up and bringing them to their appointments and that that increased um, our productivity dramatically um, and then finally we, we ended up establishing what we called the the puff or the, or the psychiatric urgent facility and all that was was a big clubhouse it sounds you know it sounds so so official it's the psychiatric urgent facility it's a big big house that we were able to rent right across the street from our clinic with couches and chairs and somebody to help check people in and what we would do is we would grab people off the street and literally take them in say look can we can we bring you here get you something to eat and while you're here let's get you signed up for Medicaid and see what we can do to help you and it was great you go over there at any time and there's just people crashed out on the couch or watching TV and there's somebody going around with an iPad signing everybody up for Medicare or for Medicaid, pardon me. Um, and it worked really well. And it's it's still up and running. So like I like I talked about earlier, we we had to find not just providers, but the right type of providers. Um, so we had, you know, myself, I, I was a dual certified, you know, CNM and, and psych APRN, still am. Um, we had you know, my, my friend, she doesn't care if I say her name, my friend Sharon, who was, you know, a psych APRN and family nurse practitioner. And then we found another family nurse practitioner who had a lot of psych experience, even though she was you know just certified as an FNP. She helped us out with a lot of the med management and was willing to see as many psych patients as she was primary care patients. And the three of us kind of formed the core of this team and it was it, it worked really well. And one of the things that the company had decided um, from the very beginning is that they wanted they wanted APRNs in place of MDs and the primary reason as you might imagine is cost um, we as advanced practice registered nurses were cheap um, when you compare the cost of hiring us to the cost of hiring a physician um, we are we're much more of a, of a financial um, benefit to the company um, and I, I know many of you have probably had the same conversation with the companies you're working for, working with, um, trying to, you know, sell companies in areas of the country that maybe, you know, maybe aren't as crazy about APRNs, especially APRNs and, and autonomy. Um, one of the big sells and, and the way you sell this to a company is always financially. If we were able to demonstrate to the company that, look, we um, we can do more for less than if you brought in um, you brought in a team of physicians not only that but there just aren't many physicians out there that are you know both a psychiatrist and an OBGYN for example that those people are if they exist they're rare uh, and so it was all APRNs not uh, not an MD in the place um, which was perfect in Nevada you have um, full practice autonomy there is a requirement that if you're going to prescribe control twos you have to be have been in practice for 2,000 hours um, so we didn't hire new grads but other than that it's it's a full practice autonomy so we do not have a single physician working with us at all except for our medical director um, and the only reason really that we had a medical director was because some of the hospitals and companies that we we contracted with um, required that we had a physician medical director and so we had one and he was actually the brother of the the owner of the company um, so he worked for free and he lives in Nashville Tennessee and so I saw him you know once a year we would hang out go to dinner but other than that he was in Tennessee we were in Nevada he didn't bother anybody didn't care to know what was going on in day-to-day -day operations um, as long as the company stayed above water uh, financially he was happy So what did we offer? Um, we offered, like I said before, psychiatric assessment. That was a huge one, right? You have people that 
have been struggling with mental illness for years, sometimes decades on the street, but have never really been formally diagnosed and certainly have never sat down with a psychiatric provider and got a solid diagnosis pinned down. And as you know, you might imagine, you can't really treat what you can't identify. Um, and so we were able to sit down with people and this is this is a great example of you know first first appointment is going to take an hour maybe more um, because you're sitting down and doing a psychiatric assessment with people that have a strong abuse history and are also struggling with you know with comorbid substance abuse and all sorts of other medical problems and they're one like all of us are they're one big big mess nobody's nobody's simple nobody's easy um, I like to, you know, tell my patients even now that, you know, in over the years of, of psychiatry, anyway, I've learned that there's no such thing as a normal person. Um, everybody's messed up. You just might be messed up in a different way than I am. But we're none of us are normal. And so these people would come in, and, and the first thing we'd have to do is like is is pin down a, a diagnosis. Okay, so that's that's gonna be a longer appointment, a lot a lot of talking, um, and hopefully you can get that done in one one stop often as many of you know you can't pin down a firm diagnosis in the first visit so you end up with a lot of rule out blank rule out this rule out that but at least you get an idea of what's going on um, the probably the most common diagnosis that I would see um, I would see a lot of people diagnosed with things like you know anxiety disorders um, or ADHD and in reality that wasn't really what was going on. There was a lot of unrecognized post-traumatic stress disorder that manifested with anxiety symptoms, um, but nobody had ever, you know, taken the time to sit down with them, build that relationship, build that trust with them to get to the point where they felt comfortable sharing their trauma history. And once they did, I mean, it becomes pretty obvious this is this is not ADHD. This is you know PTSD. Um, and then we needed to do medication management, of course, and that's a lot more complex. Um, you know, those of you that, that have done medication management for psychiatric disorders, um, it's a lot more complex when you don't know anything about this person, you don't know anything about their medical history. Um, and so we're, we're working on both of those things at the same time. And this is where it's really helpful to have a, a dual certified provider that you know, if I'm if I'm seeing somebody who's a 40 year old woman who, you know, has all of these comorbid comorbid medical issues and substance abuse issues and needs to start medication for depression and anxiety, if I'm managing all of that, then I can make sure that I know what this person is on, and there's none of this dropping the ball in between providers where you know you have one one provider's putting them on all of this stuff and then they don't know um, what they're taking. They go to the next provider visit and they get on, you know, other medicines that are not going to be helpful because they're taking the stuff that this other person prescribed. Um, we did a lot of psychotherapy. Initially, myself and my friend Sharon were doing all of the psychotherapy. And then as the clinic took off and we started to get a little more financially stable, um, we were able to hire um, a couple LCSW therapists, and then we started working with the University of Nevada and getting um, interns in, LCSW interns and um, LMFT interns, and that really helped fill out our psychotherapy team. Um, that was immensely helpful, um, letting you know the APRNs just focus primarily on medication management, primary care, women's health. And then a huge, huge part of what we did on a day-to-day -day basis was substance abuse treatment. Um, we decided at the very beginning, okay, nobody's going to work here as a prescriber without a DEA waiver to manage Subutex um, and, and Suboxone because, you know, so many of our clients needed that service. And so all three of us were busy prescribing a lot of you know, opiate dependent management um, in the form of, of Subutex and Suboxone. And once once we got up and running and, and were able to, you know, afford the stock, we started doing a lot of Vivitrol, um, the injectable naltrexone. I don't know if, if many of you have used that, but it's a, it's a miracle drug for a lot of people um, for both opiate dependence and alcohol dependence. 
and then um, speaking more about you know the things that I was primarily doing um, because a lot of our clients you know were not women and and as a CNM and PMHMP all of my clients were were female um, but my friend Sharon who's an FNP and the other FNP were seeing all of the male patients leaving most of the women's health stuff to me um, so I was doing a lot of you know annual exams in again in women that have never had one before. Um, a lot of cervical cancer and breast cancer screening, ton of colposcopy. Ended up doing like every other week, I would just set up a day and it was just all copos all day um, with, with cryoblative therapy. Um, not a physician and I've never been through the I have now, but at the time I haven't been through the, hadn't been through the training to do leaps. And so I could do cryos and then um, we actually had to refer out for leaps at the time. Um, and I did, you know, obviously a lot of GYN stuff, um, a lot of pregnancy management. And here, here's kind of where I wanted to, to talk a little bit about the situation in Reno so you understand where we're coming from there. Um, I would do pregnancy management um, antepartum care up to 36 weeks and then postpartum care. We had a issue and it, it's still an ongoing issue um, with the local hospital. We had initially said, well, let's, you know, let's work on getting privileges, admitting privileges over at the, the hospital over there and ran into just brick wall after brick wall and never did arrange admission privileges over there. Um, and that was a, a huge obstacle that, that we still haven't haven't solved over there. Um, and so I would transfer care to um, to Renown Health at 36 weeks um, and they would deliver there and then come back to me for postpartum, which was not ideal. Um, the, the clients hated that actually because, you know, they, they would build this relationship with me as their as their um, prenatal care provider and then they would lose they would lose that contact for a little while and i would still see them um they would come into the office just for a kind of a catch-up visit after 36 weeks you know once or twice once or twice a month they'd come in and just let me know how things were going over there um but the way that they were set up over there and if anybody works for renowned health i'm not i'm not bashing where you work please don't get mad at me um but there are two clinics over there one is for, so I'm talking about the, the big hospital over there in downtown Reno. One, one OBGYN clinic is for people with commercial insurance. And it is nice and it's beautiful. And you walk in and there's you know plants and there's paintings and there's a waterfall and it's gorgeous. And then there's a separate clinic for people with Medicaid. And it's dingy and it's run down and it looks like, my gosh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to go for a visit there. And the patients knew that. The patients knew, well, gosh, if, you know, if, if I go get all my prenatal care there, they're going to herd me into this, into this rundown looking building. And they don't even do appointments over there. You lie, you, you're told to come in at a, on a particular day and it's, it's sit in the waiting room and wait for your name to be called and we'll get to you when we get to you sort of thing. And the patients absolutely hated that. And we were able to at least until you know until a month before they delivered we were able to keep them in our clinic where they would come in and we you know with our own money the three of us we pulled our money together and we crafted beautiful exam rooms where i mean we had it was the coolest thing we had like fake fireplace built into the wall and you know we had had it was just it was gorgeous when you walked into our exam rooms because we wanted people to have this experience where yes I'm on Medicaid yes I'm homeless yes I'm poor but I'm gonna get the best possible care I can and I at least for you know an hour a day I'm gonna come in and be treated like like a person instead of like a number and it it was awesome patients would come in and say I you know I've never seen anything this nice before and we would just kind of smile because we know we'd been in there painting and you know building stuff and you know we went to we went to garage sales to find the furniture and then we take it and repaint it ourselves and put it together and it looked amazing by the time we were done um 
and the patients just loved it. And so we did a lot of that. Um, and you know, then then after after they delivered at at the big hospital, then you know they would come back to us for postpartum care. A couple of times I was able to, because it's it's entirely you know provider driven this decision. I was actually able to talk the attending whoever was taking care of my my client over there to at least let me come over and, and basically doula for them um which was better than nothing i would have preferred to be able to deliver my own clients there but it, it worked and and at least i was able there to, to be there to, to hold a hand um and to at least be there for those clients when they delivered um, but more often than not the answer was no we don't want you there so Let's look at you know some of the as, as this thing grew. Let's look at, at at you know some of the things that we we ended up doing and and really needing to do. Um, the first one, like I mentioned before, was transportation. Um, once we scraped up enough money to buy a van, um, then we you know we were able to initially we were having one of our front desk people was going and picking people up, and we quickly realized that you know once we were able to we needed to hire a full time driver. And so we did that, and that was amazing because we could literally troll the neighborhoods with the van and just scoop people up. Um, and once they they realized, okay, we see the van, and they saw our company logo on it, they knew who we were, um, they would realize, hey, these people are going to pick me up. They're probably going to feed me. Um, they'll take care of my medical needs. And at first, we were like, you know, really having a hard time tracking people down. And as this went on, we had people that knew our route they knew where we'd be driving and they'd be waiting for us on the corner and we would just stop and they'd load up the van and they'd you know bring another van load full of patients back to the clinic um, and we did this we ended up making several runs a day and it worked really well and now i think they've, they've got like three vans and three full-time drivers um, we were able to work with amerigroup and establish um, some housing units um, we ended up buying um, a couple of the more rundown homes in the area, and the the owner of the company, um, I, I love this guy. I I cannot believe that he did what he did. He's an amazing amazing man. He's got a huge heart. Um, he just put down his own money and bought like three houses in the area, um, hoping that eventually the the company would be successful enough that we would be able to. Um, to, to reimburse for that. But initially he just bought three houses and we, you know, the people that work there, we, we, you know, on a volunteer basis, we came in and, and we painted and we, you know, we tore up carpet and laid down tile and, you know, we got these things ready to go. And we got to the point where we had three fully functional multi-room, you know, we put bunk beds in each room. So each room I think could hold four people. And, we had several working housing units, um, and we were able to, you know, get Amerigroup to eventually reimburse us for the housing, um, and it worked really well because you had these people that all of a sudden, for the first time in their life, they had a house and they had somewhere they could they could at least say, "Look, this is where I live," and you know how hard it is to get a job if you can't have a shower and you don't have clean clothes, you don't have anywhere to do laundry, and you don't have an address. And we were able to at least provide that for them so they could get a driver's license or at least an ID card and get exactly, um, you know, Laura said dignity. That's exactly right. Able to get, you know, people into job interviews for the first time because holy cow, you're, you, you, you've got a shower, you've got clean clothes, you have somewhere for the company to, to put down as your address and got a lot of people off the streets that way. It worked really well. Um, one of the things that we we eventually realized we had a need for, um, unfortunately, you never want to think about these things, but we did eventually have to hire some security. Um, you know, downtown Reno, you know, fairly high crime area anyway. And we had to, on multiple occasions, as you might imagine, have to remove some people from the clinic and it breaks our heart when we have to do that but every once in a while someone would come in and be incredibly disruptive and we'd have to you know remove them and so eventually we had to have a full-time security person um and now i think there, there are multiple security people and even in the housing units we had to have at least some sort of security there 
um, just to you know keep an eye on things and and you know be able to to you know establish safety. You know you had to you had you had, you had women on one side of the house and men on the other side of the house, and you know you had to be able to to have somebody there to you know to kind of keep the peace and, and keep people on the sides they belonged on. Um, and so full time security became an issue that we had to address. And then finally, and this is my favorite one, um, and and she's still there. Um, we hired our own pharmacy technician, and we established an on-site dispensary uh, because we, after a couple a couple days of operation, we realized, guys, this isn't going to work um, unless we're able to provide medication there. We would, you know, initially we first started up, we would see these patients and. Uh, we would send prescriptions to Walgreens, and then there's this long, dramatic pause as everybody in the room realizes, "Oh, crap! How are they going to get there?" Um, they, you know, if you don't have a car, and the closest commercial pharmacy is a couple miles away, nobody is going to walk a couple miles and back in the summer heat in Nevada um, to go pick up your, you know, to go pick up your meds. And so we were able to establish a dispensary on site. Nevada law enables, you know, APRNs to oversee that dispensary. So we had to, in the place of the pharmacist, sign off on the prescriptions and do the far, do the prescription checking. But then our pharmacy technician could dispense them there. Um, and so that, you know, created a whole other thing we had to work on was how do we, you know, none of us had done this before. So we had to learn, okay, how do we, how do we wholesale order meds and stock a pharmacy? We, we none of us knew how to do that. Um, we had to, you know, thankfully the the local Walgreens there, uh, one of the pharmacists there was able to kind of walk us through the process. And okay, this is this is how you order meds. These are the companies you call. Uh, we didn't know any of that stuff, <laughs> um, so uh, we had to figure all of that out. And it 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 worked. Eventually, we got that up and running to the point where we could see patients and have them walk literally to the room next door, stand at the window, get their meds right there. Um, and, you know, once the, once we got the, the dispensary tied into our EHR, um, you know, we'd be putting in the meds as we're talking and the meds would be ready by the end of our appointment. Sometimes our, our pharmacy technician, technician would literally knock on the door, you know, hey, are you done? Open the door while I'm seeing the patient, hand them a bag of meds before I was even done. And it was perfect. Um, so, you know, what did we end up doing? Um, in the first six months I was there, I did, you know, we, we kept track. I did more than 500 PAPs, <laughs> um, which is, uh, that's a lot of, that's a lot of PAP tests. Um, you know, the, the people that, that make the thin prep test, I'm sure they loved us because we were just ordering cases and cases and cases of thin preps and, 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 you know, supplies for this. But uh, most of these women that we had done PAPs on had never had a PAP before. And, you know, you talk about, again, somebody with a trauma history and somebody, you know, with mental illness. And now, you know, you're explaining, explaining, okay, this is what a PAP test is. This is what we're looking for. And there's a lot initially of the, you know, you're going to put what, where type, you know, looks. Um, but once we were able to, you know, get some understanding on board that, yes, this is important. This is why this is important you know, cervical cancer is a thing that can kill you. And, you know, let's, let's, let's do some, some preventative screening here. Um, word of mouth was a big thing on the street. All of a sudden people started, started talking to their friends. And next thing you know, we'd get people calling us saying, Hey, you know, I talked to my friend who was explaining that you do paps here and that, you know, you guys are sometimes we, we'd, we'd hear terms like we, we heard that you guys are, aren't, 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 judgy or that you guys were nice and so they would come over and all of a sudden their friends were sending their friends over and we were doing doing all of this this preventative screening on these women that had never had um, never had tests before um, you know in that first six months I ended up with with a, a client roster of you know 54 pregnant women um, receiving some sort of pregnancy care most, like I said, ended up transferring um, at 36 weeks over to the big hospital, which was a drag, but they would come back. Um, and for a while, um, I ended up being the only person in northern Nevada that was doing subutex through pregnancy. And so once word of mouth got out that we were doing this, all of a sudden the big hospital started sending us patients 
um, which was incredible because they didn't want us there initially. And once they figured out, hey, I've got somebody I can send, you know, these patients, and and this, I I know some of the OBs were looking at it this way. They were looking at at a lot of these clients as you know people that, that they really didn't want, and we were saying yes, we want them, we will take them. They were sending clients to us, and I was in it. I was managing a lot of subutex through pregnancy um, that way, and and it was it was great. And again, somebody gets on subutex through their pregnancy, they're able to you know get off of heroin or you know oxycontin they've bought off the street, and then their friends find out, hey, where did you get that? And then we started getting calls and more people coming in. It, it was great. Um, we were able to provide temporary housing to more than 200 women uh, just getting the program off the ground. And most of these people were temporary. You know, they'd come in for 30 days or less. They found themselves, you know, homeless with nowhere to go. But, you know, if we could get them, you know, some someplace safe to stay and get them you know, an ID card and, um, you know, plugged into to job resources, a lot of them, you know, within 30 days, they could move out and get an apartment and get into Section 8 housing. And so it ended up being a temporary thing and a lot of turnover rate in the housing units, which is exactly what we wanted, was a lot of turnover rate. We don't want people to have to stay there for a long time. And the best part of it, and this part, you know, the, 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 the you know, military clinic manager in me just just was happy to see this when we finally ran the numbers we ended up with a no-show rate of, of less than two percent um now we cheated to be perfectly honest in that we could you know literally go pick people up and bring them to their appointments and so you know on the occasion that somebody um you know didn't show up for an appointment we could literally go find them and you know it it it, I think, traumatized my wife a little bit initially when, you know, we would we would go downtown and go find these people. Um, she still tells the story about a a you know client of mine who was a sex worker, and I knew where she worked and what hotel she worked out of, and she um, had a, a test that was positive. Um, she had a, she had a positive RPR. She she had syphilis. And it was, you know, it, 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 that's it. That's a that's something you can't just, you know, say, oh well, she didn't show up for treatment. Um, and so, you know, here I am knocking on the doors of this hotel in downtown Reno um, with a syringe full of bicillin in my hand, um, and we found her and we had administered uh, treatment there. Um, and you know, one of the hotel managers was walking by, and kind of made a, a snide comment like, you know, well, I heard screaming, but I thought something else was going on. I said, no, she was screaming because I was, you know, bicycling is painful to get, um, you know, especially 2.4 million units all at once. Um, but um, I still talk to this person today and she still laughs about that story that, you know, you found me and, and stabbed me in the butt with the penicillin. Um, but that's, that's the, that's the advantage of being downtown, right? you know, right where the, all of the action is happening. Um, so that really helped. So um, some of the challenges that we ran into um, that I haven't really talked about yet, um, I've talked about the hospital privileges and the competition with Renown Health that we ran into. The other thing that we would run into a lot was there was such a high percentage of, of migrant population. People would um, only be in town for a little bit. And one of the things we realized right off the bat that we we needed to fix um, was the fact that you know between Tanya, Sharon, and myself, the three providers, um, I had some Spanish in high school, but not enough to be confident. I can muddle my way through it, but I'm definitely not fluent enough in Spanish to you know knock on doors and convince people to come in for a visit. And so we had to. Um, find a couple staff members that spoke fluent Spanish. And once we did that, we were able to capture a lot of that migrant population because a lot of them were Spanish speaking only. And a lot of them, you know, because a lot of them were, you know, were eligible for Medicaid, um, didn't know it. And 
because they don't speak English, nobody had really ever bothered to go and tell them about, hey, you know, you you're entitled to this. You know, you're, you know, you, you're a, you're a, you're you know, you you have healthcare available to you if we can get you in, and somebody can speak your language, and so that helped us capture a lot of the migrant population. Um, unfortunately, you know, as you might imagine, um, I ended up with a lot of, you know, abnormal PAPs, for example, and by the time you get your test back, the patient has moved and they don't live there anymore, and so that you know that kind of remains an open-ended challenge for us. How do we you know how do we track these people down? How do we build enough trust where they're going to tell us where on earth they're going when they leave? Um, and you know, how do you find people who don't have a phone and don't speak English? Um, and you know, if anybody has an answer to that one, I'm all, I'm all ears because we we you know still leave that one on the table as a, as a challenge to be addressed. Yeah, okay, oh, I think that's my last slide. Um, so anyway, that that um, that was my first midwife job, um, and I loved it. If if it weren't for the fact that I knew, you know, in my heart and soul that the big thing that I was missing that I wasn't able to do was deliver babies, um, I would have never left that job. I was there for about a year and finally realized that, number one, my wife um, hated Northern Nevada, um, but number two, that I really did miss delivering and so I eventually moved on to a job where I could catch babies. And here I am in Tacoma, Washington at Franciscan Health doing that. Um, but I loved that job. I loved every minute that I worked there. Um, and I still sometimes think, gosh, you know, I could, I could go back to that. But I love where I'm at. I love what I do. Um, so that's um, really the end of my, my presentation. Um, I think Chris was going to be available to moderate questions if people had questions for me. And I'm going to take a drink. Yeah, so if anybody has any questions, um, <clears throat> feel free to type them or you can even come on and share your camera and your mic. You got lots of, I don't, you probably couldn't see them as you were going, but um, lots of interaction and, and compliments as you were presenting. Let's see. Naomi says, is there anything like that program in Washington? It seems like the population would be a little different, but such a fantastic program. Is there anything like that for you there in Washington? Um, you know, I haven't seen anything similar to that. We are trying as hard as we can at the place where I am to get this off the ground. I've got one of, so I'm, I'm now, I've gone from being, you know, the only midwife in the building to have, to now I've joined a practice where I, I now the 22nd midwife in our group and with a large group like that, you know, you have a lot of group decisions to make and a lot of pushback that you don't have when you're the only one there. And right now we're, we're working on establishing a substance abuse treatment program um, within our group. Um, I've got one of my physician partners who's, DEA wavered, and there's myself and one other midwife who's working on it. Um, once we kind of get that established, we're really going to be trying um, to at least mirror some of those services where we are. Um, if anybody knows the the Tacoma area, um, we're in a great location um, at St. Joseph's Franciscan Health. Um, we are, you know, we're we're in an area where there is a a, a lot of good we can do right where we're planted. And so we're really, you know, we're getting this up and running. Um, I've been at, at my present job now six months. So it takes a little while to get people to, um, you know, to get, get people to the point where you can, you can have an, enough influence in the organization. At first, you're just the new guy. Um, so we're working on it. That's a long answer to a short question. Sorry. And then let's see, we have Sarah wants to know, where do you think is the best for settling or the best setting for a CNM, um, PMH, and P to practice? Ooh, that, you know, that, that is a great question. And obviously one I've struggled with, you know, in, in, in my midwifery career um, is kind of figuring out, okay, where, where do I go? Um, and it really depends on what you want to do. Um, if you want to do primarily psychiatry, um then you can you can you can join a psychiatric practice and be 
you know, kind of the perinatal mental health expert, so to speak. Um, or if you want to do primarily midwifery with, and there's always a lot of psychiatry in, in OB world anyway, um, I get more bang for my buck really in, a, in an OBGYN practice where I can do a lot of psychiatry. Um, it doesn't work nearly as well going the other way because you know, if you join a psychiatric practice and the first time they see you with a speculum in your hand, they're, they're, you know, their minds are blown. They're like, what are you doing? Um, I, I did um, try that for a little while. Um, I worked at, at, um, at, at a place in Montana where it was a psychiatric practice and they were very, very open to, you know, hey, whatever you want to do in terms of women health, women's health, you can do. Um, but it just wasn't well set up for that. So I did, I mean, I did some things like you'd have somebody admitted to the inpatient psychiatric unit and while they're there, I'd put in an IUD, something like that. Um, but it works much better doing it the other way. Join a an OBGYN group or a midwifery group and practice psychiatry while you're there. Logistically, it works much better that way. All right, Jessica says, um, where was the funding for this company coming from? So the company that we worked for, um, they had started something like this first in Las Vegas and it had taken off in Las Vegas. And the guy that owned the company is kind of this eccentric multimillionaire. Um, and I realized that those people are just not everywhere. Um, and so this was a unique opportunity. It's one of the reasons that we we joined the three of us because we realized, hey, we've got somebody who A, has the money and B, has the desire and the, the philanthropic heart to do this um, who can actually put down a significant chunk of change to get this off the ground because that's always the challenge, right? I mean, I you know, if you want to just start this, it takes a significant amount of, of financial capital to get something like this off the ground. Um, you know, as a midwife with seven kids, I don't have it, uh, but um, he certainly did. And he was willing to, you know, to buy us an office building and then to put the money down to, you know, buy a few of the rundown homes in the area so we could, we could make housing out of it. And without somebody backing you like that it is really hard to do. Uh, so then Holly says, and I think you kind of answered this, but how are you connecting your psych with your CNM now? So when I joined this practice um, that I'm at now, I, you know, they'll never admit it, but I'm quite sure that one of the reasons that they hired me because was because of the PMHMP part. I am able to set aside about two appointments a day that are strictly psych out of my you know my busy you know midwifery schedule and so when i have partners um and you know we're talking 22 midwives and 10 physicians um when i have partners who say you know holy cow i've got this person that uh, just came to us for prenatal care and she's you know bipolar one and on four different meds and i have no idea what to do you know, now they have at least a resource they can turn to and they'll either schedule them with me um, strictly for a psychiatric med management appointment or at the very least they'll call me and say, okay, this is the situation, this is what I've got, what do I do? And it's it's helpful, I think, to have somebody, you know, with with that psych experience in, in the building who can say, okay, well, well, let's, you know, let me explain to you, you know, what the best meds are here and how to do this right. And so I, I find myself doing an awful lot of psych. Um, also, I find myself doing an awful lot of just consultation with my partners. They'll they'll call up and say, "I've got this, you know, person with you know PTSD, and I'm looking for something pregnancy safe to help with the anxiety. What can I do?" And you're able to to kind of give advice to your partners that way too. It really helps. All right, Sita um, was wondering, did you have a special billing service? Medicaid can be difficult with reimbursements. <laughs> you are not kidding. Um, yes, so thankfully, like I said, the, the company that um, was doing this had already started in Las Vegas. 
And so Nevada Medicaid, they had already established kind of the, the billing service and everything. And what we were doing while I was there was using the Las Vegas office to handle all of our billing. Um, eventually, they were able to move some of that up to Reno, so it was more local. Um, but man, I would, and I'm sure most of you who are in practice have been through this too, I would get nasty emails and calls every day from billing saying, what the hell are you doing? Um, <laughs> do you know how to code this stuff? And I, I think that, you know, the coding and you know, things like getting the right ICD-10 codes and the right CPT codes on things. Um, that was the biggest challenge for me as a new provider because I didn't know any of that when I started. And I didn't really have anybody other than billing in Las Vegas to ask. And so if I could, um, you know, if I could change one thing about what we did would have been, okay, let's, let's focus on the coding and billing aspect of it earlier. And let's make sure we got that down first because we got a lot of... A lot of our our you know submissions were kicked back by Medicaid saying no no, no that's not right. Um, yeah, billing and coding is 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 very I difficult. Love to navigate. Medicaid nasty grams. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh, oh. yes. All right, um, and I so I share this question because um, this one is if if I had the I don't know maybe someday I'll do it. I've always kind of been interested in midwifery. Actually, I since I met you, to be honest, I was like, you know what, I could do this. Like, I, I think I would be interested in doing this. But, um, you know, some other things have to fall in place for me. But Jesse says, what advice would you give to other men who want to become midwives? I faced a lot of sexism and prejudice, but I know this is my true calling. Thank you again. Boy. Um, yeah. So, you know, some advice to people that, you know, to, to especially men that want to enter midwifery. Um, you know, number one, grow a thick skin. Um, you are going to get patients that don't want to see you because you're a male, and you can't get upset about that. Um, what I found in in our practice in Reno, and even out here in Washington, is that you'll run into a lot of people who don't want to see you because you're male. And sometimes in Reno, what I was able to do was just sit down with them, say, "Look, can we at least?" sit down and have a talking appointment where nobody's taking their clothes off and we're just going to talk through some of the issues you're facing and this can be more more of a psych visit than a a you know than a an annual exam for example and honestly once they get to know you um most of the time they were you know one or two visits into it, they said, you know what, I'm fine with it. Let's, let's, let's schedule my PAP for next visit. Um, but as a male midwife, you're going to run into patients that just don't want you. And honestly, you're going to get people that schedule with a midwife group because they're expecting that group to be entirely female. Um, I get that in Washington sometimes. That happens. Um, also, you've got to recognize that you're going to be looked at differently no matter what you do um, you have to be very careful about the way that you talk you have to be very careful about not coming across as you know aggressive or threatening um, when I you know when I have um, PMHMP students um, sometimes with me and I I'd get I get them in Reno it was great you know some of the things that I, I, I would spend a lot of time talking about were just okay as you know as a six foot one male, how do I enter the room to talk to somebody who's been traumatized? Um, you know, you don't stand over people with your hands on your hips looking like an intimidating authority figure. You always sit lower than the patient. You don't block the door between, you know, the patient and their escape route. I mean, just little things. You always have to be aware of your body language um, more so when you're when you're a male provider in in a women's health area. Um, the other thing is that you need to give it time for your population to know you. Um, you have to not be upset when at first they just, because all if all they know about you is, I've got a choice of seeing two midwives. One of them's a dude and one of them's not. Um, most of them are not going to pick you and you have to be willing to give it time for people to know, okay, I'm not choosing between 
a man and a woman, I'm choosing between Jake, who I know and my, you know, my sister delivered with and says great things about, and now I want to go see this person. Um, they have to know you, not just know that you're a male or, you know, whatever your, your situation might be. Um, so those are some things. The other thing, and, and Jesse, this is something that, you know, I wish wasn't true, but it is the most prejudice and pushback that you're going to get is not going to be from patients. It's going to be from other providers and nurses. Um, when I started my job here in Washington, I was approached by one of the people that I work with, um, another provider, and was told straight to my face, just so you know, I hate men, I hate that you're here, and I'm pissed off that they hired you. And I mean, what do you do with that? I mean, <laughs> oh my gosh. You know, if you if you re reverse the roles, if we were an all-male practice and we hired a female provider, and I said, just so you know, I hate women, and I'm pissed off that they hired you, um, they wouldn't even let me pack my stuff. They would just take my badge away and say, we'll mail your stuff to you, goodbye. Um, you have to be willing to not lose heart when you hear stuff like that because you will. Anyway, sorry, another long yeah. answer to a short question. No, no, it's good. So um, there's actually a lot more questions here for you, but um, our time is up. So it, um, when we're, I'll email you after. Is there an email where people can, I can list, put it with the video so they can email you if they want to ask you questions or anything? Yeah, let me, let me. Yeah, in fact, I'll, I'll put it in the chat box here too. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that'll that way, if if you have a question that wasn't answered, because I saw quite a few in there that are really um, interesting and and good questions, and I, I hate to miss them. I just went in order, uh, and I just didn't get to all of them. But um, and also, you should probably know. I'm pretty sure this was record turnout by quite a bit. So <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Um, um, and I put both my my home email and my work email on there just in case. Okay. And I'll, I'll pass that on to for the um, when I do the video. But yeah, thank you so much for doing this. It was very interesting all around um, just from your kind of your unique standpoint in midwifery and adding the psych component, but also anyone that's in the in the frontier DNP program. I think it's great to see this because we do the short um, rapid cycle PDSA um, quality improvement projects and so something to your scale, obviously you can't do in eight weeks, but this is exactly the kind of thing where once you finish Frontier's DNP uh, experience, you can take take what you've learned and then go, you've got the, the toolkit to do exactly the kinds of things Jake did. So um, this was a uh, very good timing in the term for everyone to see. So thank you so much once again. Awesome, thanks for having me guys. No problem. And I'm sure we'll we'll see you around Frontier soon. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> All right. All right. See you, Chris. Bye. Bye.